Hello, everybody. I'm just testing a little bit because this is the first time that I have music on the stream. And I'm just going to make sure that the volumes are okay. I don't... Okay, it's... Uh... So it seems okay, let's uh, try it out and uh, hopefully it's gonna be okay. So it seems okay, let's uh, try it out and hopefully it's gonna be okay. I should have recorded this before I <laughs> so I'm just gonna lower it a little bit and uh, so it doesn't overpower my voice anyways afterwards uh, after I see the I uh, watched um, the VOD, I'll uh, adjust any volumes to see if... Uh... Yeah. Uh, where's my mouse? Okay, cool. So, thanks to anybody that joined, or everybody that joined. Um, I wanted to delve a little bit and try to develop a, uh, some sort of prototype um, that allows you to bypass group policies in very specific scenarios. So just to give you a little bit of background, sometimes, so group policy is a way that you have on Windows networks uh, with um, um, to configure all devices so you can uh, centrally configure all the windows machines in your network uh, by using active directory and a thing called group policies and group policies in a sense in the, the actual workstations and servers that you are configuring through it they in most of the cases what they do is create registry entries that then the applications uh, and Windows itself goes and check what configurations they should use. And those uh, registry keys usually uh, reside in the local machine uh, registry hive, um, which means a normal user cannot change them. So let's hypothetically, um, <laughs> that word fails me, English is hard. Um, think about this scenario. So you, you as an attacker compromise the machine. You have yet uh, been able to escalate privileges, uh, but you don't actually want to do that or you haven't been able to. Uh, is a reasonably hardened uh, Windows deployment. So you start to think about other options. What, what could you do in order to get better uh, privileges uh, and better access to the rest of the network so you can pivot into other machines and spread your attack? So one quote, uh, I don't remember who originally said this, but uh, attackers don't uh, crack passwords, they don't uh, brute force, they just steal the passwords and authenticate with those legit credentials. They steal the credentials and they authenticate, they don't brute force, they don't 
they they use the credentials. So imagine that you think of, uh, thinking about it and you get faced with a deployment that has, for example, Firefox as a browser. And you think to yourself, maybe they, most people do a lot of work in, the, in Firefox in their enterprise uh, web applications. And how, how can I leverage that? Well, I just developed some malicious uh, extension that I, uh, since I already have access to the system, I will install it. It will be a lot stealthier than your, uh, your uh, probably your um, keylogger uh, screen recording with the VNC or all these sort of things, or your interpreter payload. I just disguise it, disguise it as some random, or not some random, or something that is related with that environment, uh, or something that would be related with Windows or Firefox, and the normal user will just not really notice it, because it's just an extension that will stay there, and every single post that you do to a web server that has a password field on it, or every single form that has a password field on it, and it's filled on it, and it's, sorry, and it's submitted or something, you intercept those credentials, the, the, the credentials being sent. And then you have access to more credentials without uh, raising so many red flags by installing uh, uh, executables and uh, putting it in, in uh, auto runs and all these sort of things. But while the Firefox is the default browser on that workstation, it has been properly configured to not allow the, the user to install uh, add-ons. So you don't really have uh, an easy way to do that. So I, I, the scenario is a little bit far-fetched, uh, I guess you could probably do other stuff, but let's, let's for the sake of the argument, focus on, uh, on this. Uh, when I say Firefox, you can choose many other uh, applications for the same for this type of scenarios and um, and basically Firefox uh, since this is a Windows joined machine it has been configured to uh, group policy so let me just show you uh, what that actually means uh, on Windows so if you come edit and I'm gonna run it as administrator and don't forget, this is you without having escalated privileges. So you don't have domain admin, so you cannot change directly. You cannot change <clears throat> the, um, the, the registry settings. So if you, as I said, so group policies, most of the times, what, what they represent on the local machine is just some entries on the registry on the local uh, machine hive. So something that if the ACLs access control list haven't been um, messed up, you as a normal user don't have access. You can read them most likely, uh, but you cannot change them. So in Firefox, you have this, uh, you have a lot of other sub keys. <clears throat> Sorry, but the one that matters to us in this case would be this one, the block add-ons, for example, the about page where you can install the add-ons. Um, which other one, maybe permissions, I think, if I know. There are another, there is another one. This one, for example, also may, might matter to us. To, to on the scenario where we want to install um, not a keylogger but we want to install something more stealthy or something that would be a little bit more hidden not so obvious um, so I'm going to show you in Firefox. So if we click here and with this current uh, group policy, if you do this, which is the add-ons page, it is blocked. 
If you go to the Firefox web page as well, that or the add-ons page for Firefox, it doesn't also allow you to install add-ons. It's completely blocked. So how do you bypass this? How, how can you, without have being, having the ability to change the registry keys, how do you uh, go around it? So I was thinking about this and uh, since Firefox is still running on the context of the unprivileged user, is the actual unprivileged user that launches Firefox, you can probably inject a DLL into it that intercepts the, um, the registry key reading and changes the values to the values that you want. And you might say, oh, but you are not local uh, admin. You, you don't even have local admin. You don't. So how do you inject a DLL? Because for you to inject a DLL, you need, at least on Windows 10, uh, actually, it's a little bit more, well, uh, I think it was even Windows XP uh, Service Pack 2, you already, it was when they changed it and you started to need admin to do that. <clears throat> so, uh, how, how, how do you do that? Well, if you, uh, your application, the application that is going to inject the DLL, uh, is the one creating the Firefox process. Since the Firefox process is going to be con uh, considered uh, a child process of that application, you can do whatever you want to the memory uh, of the Firefox process. So you don't have that restriction. You can read and write to the that process memory. While if you just launch Firefox and then you try to inject the DLL with your application, it will fail because then it's trying to access uh, uh, another process, which is not a child of this, uh, this one, uh, is it's, it separates it, it protects it. Um, and then if, uh, you get to do that, if you get to inject the DLL by launching, uh, the Firefox as a, as a child process of your injector, you can then do whatever you want, you inject the DLL, and you can then intercept uh, the execution or the call, call out, uh, the ca uh, calling of Firefox to the registry uh, functions, the registry API on Windows. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's just summarize it and of course you are also you are still uploading uh, a dll you are still uploading an executable but that's a one time thing it's something that is not constantly running and you can potentially also do it this uh, in other manners um, there's a lot of uh, fileless uh, attacks now that you could leverage to do these sort of things as well so um, this is the simplest manner uh, so you could also, instead of injecting uh, uh, an entire DLL, you can just on the fly inject uh, um, code into the application, uh, divert the registry callings uh, call functions or that the, the Firefox uses uh, to those of yours and then is the same thing, but it's a little bit more complex to implement. And for the purpose of a prototype and playing around with it, uh, I think uh, just injecting the library, uh, it's a lot easier and a lot uh, more practical. And as always, attackers are lazy as anybody else. So I don't think uh, if they don't need to, they won't invest the time to actually develop uh, a, a more complex approach. Hmm. That being said, and let me see if I'm missing, if I'm forgetting something. Okay, let's, uh, I don't think so. Let's go with the punches and uh, let's focus on moving on. Oh, um, yeah. So 
what I like to do when I develop something uh, like this for Windows, I, if you noticed, I do have Visual Studio and it's licensed and everything is the community edition and whatnot. Uh, but I mostly use it only when I'm developing something in C Sharp and stuff like that for something more complex or uh, that requires it to be more lightweight or I use uh, C or C++. Plus 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 c plus plus sorry um and i like to do it on uh, on uh, linux because i use um, uh, cross compilation i use uh, mingate uh, gw um, and i cross compile and the executables are usually smaller uh, the dlls are a lot easier to inject in memory because they don't have all the things that uh, Microsoft Visual Studio tends to add uh, to your DLL even though you don't want it. Uh, so I installed Visual Studio Code, which I'm trying out. I never played with it. This is the first time that I play, I'm playing with it. And it's pretty good. I have to say it's really, really, really nice uh, IDE. Uh, and for whoever wants to to try it out it's pretty pretty good let me just check one thing i'm not sure I'm not sure if I'm, I'm seeing something here that oh no okay it's just uh yeah it's just um a, stream manager that is malfunctioning because it's saying that I'm not streaming and indeed I just tested that I am so it's a little bit a it's a little bit weird okay anyways so so I already set up a skeleton project to test this uh, uh, theory of mine uh, that you can easily bypass because you you would you will be able to bypass GPOs because first they are written in registry. Second, the application is also is the one responsible to uh, honor those configurations. So if the application is launched in the user context, the user can change the behavior of the application. It's uh, it's a given. So you can easily bypass uh, the GPOs. So that's my uh, that's what I want to explore and show you that. Uh, and to see if it actually is possible because it makes sense to me in my mind but yeah i want to test it and see if it's possible so i already created a, a skeleton project so i have uh two main components to that project uh is the injector uh and the library so the injector is just a simple windows application will be a simple windows application that does, does the injection uh, of the library into the Firefox process. Uh, I already created, this is the main entry point for uh, DLLs on Windows and the injector code has the main entry point for applications on Windows. So, but okay, so the first thing we need to know, we need to figure it out is how do we then uh, inject this DLL? So there are many ways to do it. There's a lot more advanced ways than uh, than what I'm going to show to you. Um, but this is a pretty well tested and valid uh, approach. Very easy to implement. Uh, I'll will most likely need to Google a lot of stuff because I don't know everything by uh, by heart. But uh, let's just get down to it and. Uh, and start so we will need many things and one of the uh, uh, one of the or two of those things are paths and they are the um, path to the executable that we want to Ooh, let me see that one? No, I'm getting it wrong so is the path to the executable that we want to launch as a child process and the path to the library. So let's just declare that. No, that's, uh, yeah. 
let's see. This one. No. How do you define? Okay, let's do it like this. Oh, uh, this is the Portuguese keyboard. Okay. Uh, I don't remember how you define the um, strings on uh, Windows in a way that is agnostic to whether you are compiling in uni Unicode. Or if you are compiling in uh, in ANSI, so it's agno agnostic, so you don't really notice the difference. So this is the wide, so it's PT char. Yeah, I think it's PT char. Yeah. So PT char, independently of being Unicode, is defined right. I'm so old. I don't know how to read C anymore. If Unicode, oh, uh, it's this one. Yeah, it's PT char. Okay, it's a pointer. Okay. So let's do that. So we do this, and we say. Uh, executable so the executable that we want to launch and that will be if i remember correctly uh, program files because i am Pretty sure my installation on the other machine is uh, 64 bits. Uh, Firefox. Or Firefox. I'm pretty sure that's the path executable. Let's just confirm it. Let's see. Program files. First fire, fire Mozilla Firefox, and then it should be here Firefox. Yeah. So now, now the library, and we are hard coding all of these uh, things, all of these variables or configuration things, uh, because this is just a prototype. And for now, to see that it just that it works, I don't want to add too much complexity. Maybe afterwards. Uh, we can polish it a little bit better, uh, but for now it should be should suffice. And anyways, when you are also when you are hacking something, uh, when you are targeting a system, and you don't have much time because that's what uh, that's. The amount you have a slotted time of amount to attack a system and they are not paying for more and uh, you have to just do it a little bit dirty um, and quickly develop a solution and test it out on your on your side and then when it works out then apply it on your engagement so and then if you it's something useful that you want to reuse on other engagements and other works you just polish it tested it in another other environments and uh, uh, without any bugs and whatnot but in the beginning uh, there's not much time for those sort of things so usually uh, so i'll assume that i will always put the library under the desktop for now and it's gonna call be called library.dll so if i want to compile this i'm just gonna change the directory here to the injector directory and i'm gonna use a make f make file linux and i want to compile 464 
It says here on the make file Linux, but it's, it's just because it's the cross compilation. So it will always compile a Windows executable. Um, but this means that you have, if you are on Linux and you want to compile for 64 bits, then you use this make file. And uh, as you can see here, you have also the 32 bits. There's also the 32 bits. But if you look at the 64, it's nothing very special. It's just uh, the normal make file and we define here the i define here the the compiler the linker uh the resources how you uh, the tool that uh, compiles the resources to be embedded on the executable uh, typical windows stuff nothing very special uh, and then this is the configuration uh, uh, to actually do the the build uh, so if we do this it gives a lot of warnings because I have all the warnings enabled. If I do something like this, uh, and it's mostly unused variable, so no warnings, no problems. It's just uh, I like to have uh, all warnings enabled because sometimes they show show you a warning that you go like, mm, "What?" and and if you don't fix that warning, most likely it's it's not a problem because it doesn't uh, cause an error. Uh, in compilation time so you don't give it too much heat but it might just be that it will cause a, uh, an error during uh, runtime so it causes a bug so that's why I like to have all warnings and go through them and if I see something that is a little bit weird uh, then I fix it so we have the executable and the library so the first thing we need to be able to do is create a child process. And on Windows, um, uh, the API to do that is called create process. Not that obvious, right? Uh, so if you do create process, and I like this about Visual Studio Code is that I uh, this is a sidebar. I just added on the configuration the directory for where I have the compiler path and also the include path. And automatically it it shows me, it parses all the include files and it shows me all this contextual um, help that I wouldn't have otherwise, which is the Arguably, it's not arguably, it is one of the functions of uh, ID, but taking into consideration that this is uh, Visual Studio Code uh, developed by Microsoft is, is quite interesting to see how Microsoft has uh, changed its approach and started to be a lot more open than it was uh, like not even five years ago, maybe uh, five years ago. It, it's, it's amazing. It's really, really nice to see such a big company. Uh, and I'm not a, a Microsoft fanboy at all, uh, but it's really, really nice to see them um, do this. So, and I am already seeing that this would be most like, yeah, it's going to compile in ANSI also because I didn't have, I don't have the define uh, for Unicode, but it's okay. It's not a problem. So we call create process and we say we want the application name which i think is executable which is the variable that we defined there's no common line and for now none of that none of that inherit handles i do not i think this is a null as well i don't want it then I need to look at this because I'm pretty sure uh, create suspended is needed. This flag is needed. So what happens is for you to be able to inject the library before the process fully loads, that's when you want to do that so that you can then uh, hook uh, the functions, divert the functions uh, the target functions execution flow in this case the registry functions you want to create the process so but in suspended mode so basically windows creates the process loads everything uh, 
uh, all the libraries, resolves all the um, reallocations, does everything that it needs to do up to the point where the executable is ready to start, to actually call the main function of the executable. So you want to create suspended so that Windows stops exactly at that point. You can do all your modifications that you want to do, in this case, inject uh, DLL, and then you resume the execution and all your modifications are in place and everything works fine without any crashes or whatnot. So I'm pretty sure I need this flag. Then I don't care about this, I think. Current directory, I don't care about this one. I will need this one, if I remember correctly. The startup info. I haven't done this in a while. And I will need this one as well. So then uh, what we can do, this should already allow you to launch, this should already launch the Firefox executable. What we need to do afterwards is free the handle uh, just to be even though the application is going to, is it free? No, close handle, which will free the handle anyways. Um, but it's not strictly necessary in our use case because this is a one-time run and if it leaks memory, the, the process is gonna be killed anyway, it's gonna end anyway. But uh, let's be educated or polite, not educated, let's be polite and uh, do that so we're just gonna say if process handle is different from null because the calling the the creation of the process may fail so uh, sorry i spend whole day uh, typing on a uh, English US keyboard and then when I come home I start typing on a Portuguese keyboard it's <laughs> it's not easy to go back um, so let's just test it let's just see if this uh, actually launches uh, the process so let's copy it injector if I remember correctly, it's mount temporary stream, I think. So if I go now into my Windows machine, I believe I should have here. Yep. Look at this. You see, with an icon and everything. Actually, these icons are come from. Uh, this collection, I think, is called Crystal Icons, and it's the um, they were the artist is a person called Everaldo. You can find them in the Fast Icon. They are GPL. Uh, but yeah, I uh, just wanted to give a shout out. It's it, it has really nice icons that you can reuse for your projects and stuff. So, let's see if it doesn't crash. It didn't do anything. So it didn't crash, but it didn't launch uh, Firefox. So clearly uh, there's something wrong with this. So let's just double check that the path is right. So I'm gonna... Let's double check. Maybe I forgot something. No, I don't think so. Looks pretty legit, so. Program files, Mozilla, Firefox, Firefox. Yeah. That's legit. So it might just be that I got the variables wrong and it's actually the command line variable. So let's just poke it a little bit. If it fails, we will just, uh, I'll just Google it. No, 
no, it failed. So I'm clearly missing stuff. So uh, and let me just do something as well. Uh, does it work like this? Yeah, because I don't want you to see all my dirty links. Anyways, so. Well, I don't want to leak any customers or anything like that. That's more the case, but anyway. So, uh, create process. Uh, create process. Let's see what it says. So, usually I skip these things. And... Mm, interesting. So, for example, creating a process, and I go, I skip these things, and I go straight to the. Yeah, as I said, we need the startup info and the process information. Okay. I go straight to the example because it just shows you all the basic usage, and that most of the times is uh, oh is is enough. I'm just seeing here. I it's not oh okay. Yeah, you see, that's why you shouldn't actually, sometimes that's why you shouldn't actually skip the, <laughs> and go straight to the example because I actually got it wrong. So create process doesn't return a handle, it returns a boolean. Uh, so I was thinking it would return straight up a handle, but uh, not. Yeah, so... So we're gonna call it... Launch result. So, wait, my English is not helping me today. So, launch. So, if launch result equals true, and you don't need to do this, you more experienced programmer will say, oh, you can just do this, but. For the sake of being obvious, I'm just gonna do this. Um, so if it's equal to true, then everything is okay. Now I need to declare this variable, startup information. Oh, let's call it startup info. Let's do it like this and then process information and we are using zero memory but zero memory doesn't exist why are you warning me ah okay it's just this so why do we want to zero out these um, structures before we we make use of them is because since these structures are going to be um, used to return uh, values you want to really be sure that the memory where they are allocated is zero because otherwise you might have um, trash or garbage that is returned with your structures and gives you the wrong values instead of giving you a zero for instance it gives you a, a, a three or a four uh, and you don't want that you want a, it to be the actual value that is supposed to be there so that's why you zero out the structures because it's not a guaranteed that windows will uh, provide you um, with uh, clean memory especially because this is being most likely allocated on the stack uh, and 
then process actually it's going to be called process info just to follow the same coding uh, standard so a startup info needs to have the size the CV which is basically count bytes or something like that which is uh, it indicates the size of a structure Windows has this a lot so and why do they have this because they support the API supports both the Unicode and the ANSI standard and since startup info structure most likely has uh, strings on them yep LPW string LPW string so in this case white string if it's the startup info w if you look at the startup info a is lp string so LP, lp strings are characters so one byte long each while lpw string are w shars so it's white uh, characters so it's eight byte long so this has an impact on the pointer size as well so even though lpw string is a pointer uh, they want to make sure there is this difference uh, because it's a long pointer um, as well so is it the long pointer mm, well it's a pointer anyways and that's why they have I think that's why they have the count bytes, if I remember correctly. It's because the, the structure, uh, in terms of size, varies. Oh, yeah, wait, no. I know. Uh, wait, I'm doing a mistake. Um, it's not because of that. It's because they actually have uh, probably <laughs> uh, another version of this function that has more elements to it more properties to it and they want to specify through the size which structure it actually is so that they don't try to access elements that are not in the actual structure it's a little bit complex now i'm i'm starting to remember all these things it's a little bit more uh complex i'll i'll probably explain it in a better way if i go read something uh, but that's the case, not because the because the pointer only changes, not uh, only because of the architecture. Is, if it is 32 bits or 64 bits, so it it's not really because of uh, you having a uh, pointing to a um, wide string or pointing to an ANSI string. So, anyways. Uh, and by the way, when I reference Unicode, when I say Unicode, I'm talking about uh, UTF-8 because Unicode has UTF-8, UTF-16, UTF-32, uh, but usually um, I'm referencing to UTF-8 when I say it's 8 bytes long because when it's UTF-16, it's 16 bytes long. So you have, uh, in Unicode, you have different lengths for the strings. Anyways, so we need the uh, size of, yeah, no, size of. So I can just lazily copy this one. And so that seems to be everything that we need for now. And then we need to come here. And pass it on. So, so we need to pass it, pass a pointer to the structure. So this is the startup info. And this is the uh, process info. One thing I want to say is about uh, coding standards. So if you look at the um, declaration of the API on Windows, it says LP process something, some LP start something, something. Uh, when it's a Boolean, they say B something, something, something. Um, 
I think this comes from legacy when you didn't have uh, that advanced uh, development environments, IDEs. And you needed as much context as you could get from just looking at the, um, the variable's name. And you needed to know it's a long pointer to something, most likely a structure because it's called process information. Or you needed to know, oh, it's a boolean uh, just by looking at the name of the variable. Uh, or it's a, a double word, a eight byte long uh, word. So they, uh, uh, so it's nowadays that's not needed. So I prefer to use a lot more simpler names. Uh, so it goes to say, most of the times coding, uh, especially if you are developing quick stuff uh, and you're not developing in a group with other people, coding standards usually is a, more of a personal taste thing than uh, anything else so don't come complain <laughs> just do what uh, it's you feel better it's that is better for you so oh actually let me just double check that i'm not forgetting anything oh wait Oh, wait, wait, wait. So let's say zero first, because I was creating the actual process in suspended mode. That's why it's probably actually uh, lingering in uh, memory without it actually had been launched, unless uh, task list. Hmm. Should have searched for it. No, it's not. It probably crashed when I close when uh, the parent application exit. Yeah, that's another reason. I wasn't waiting for the process to actually be launched, so that's why when the so when a child is uh, spawn uh, and a child process <laughs> is spawned, then if the parent process exit, uh, the child process is killed. If it didn't fork away from uh, the parent process so i wasn't actually waiting for the process to actually be loaded but in any case i'll just create it uh in non-suspended mode and i'm going to do that just that i'm gonna wait infinitely for the process uh, to do its thing for the child process to do its thing by calling wait for single object. <coughs> Sorry. And then afterwards I'll close the handles. Uh, it's a lot easier like this. So. Let's wing it. Let's see if we are lucky and this thing works. It's going to be nice if it does. No, nope. it seems to have failed. Uh, I see. No, it failed. So let's see. What am I missing here? What am I missing here? Usage common line. No module name. Common line. So common line is field. Then is no null. Uh, false or null is the same thing. In Windows at least. Kind of. That's another thing. False, then no flags, no environment, nothing, use nothing, and then something, something. Hmm. 
Hmm. So it should be launching okay. Why it's not? It's let's see. Well, we don't need a message box saying that it failed because we already know it's failing because the process is not launching. So isn't it? Why isn't it launching? Mozilla Firefox Firefox.exe. Hmm. Might be something with the string. Because this one is using create process. If I create, click here. It's currently create process A. It currently evaluates to create process A, right? So let's see if the problem is with the path. LPC string. LP string. Oh, interesting. Hmm. LP. Oh, not this one. Sorry. Let's change. Because this should PT char PT char PT char and then uh, LP string is char as well. LP string is a char, which is a char. So it shouldn't be a problem of it shouldn't be this. This shouldn't be the problem. But let's try it anyways. It's not a different type, so... No, it's not working. Oh, this is going to be a short stream if I don't get this one thing, this thing, or a long stream actually if I don't get this one working. Um, okay, what we're gonna do is maybe convert this to a. So, main function, normal main function. Uh, int. Oh, what the hell? Int. Uh, I still return zero, but what we're gonna do is the old style debugging. Uh, printf. Now bear with me. Uh, uh. zero or I can just do it X maybe it's easier and then it says that if create process succeeds it returns the process information structure containing handles and identifiers of the new process and its primary thread the thread and process handles are created with full access rights although access can be restricted if you specify security descriptors Okay, let's do this. Okay, let's see what is the error that Windows is returning. Else, we're gonna create process fails. And I don't care about this one because I want to return only zero. So. Unused variable. Okay. This one 
shouldn't be a problem. This warning shouldn't be a problem, so. Oh, really? Why is that? What's going on here? For reals? Um, am I doing a clean? Yeah, I'm doing a clean all. So, why? No. I don't have any... I'm thinking I don't have any application whitelisting uh, because otherwise it would give an error. So it's not it's not being blocked. So it must be an error. So the best thing to do, really, is... Sorry. X64. Oop. And debug it. So what we're going to do, symbols, injector, import, where's the create process? It's create process A. So let's, and then we run. We run again. Entry point, blah, blah, blah. Create process, okay. So this is the call to create process. And let's look at the stack. Or the registries, in, registers in this case. So it does seem to be passing on correctly. So let's just run until return. I think is this one, no. Tracing to execute until return. So you call that one. So we just single step into it. Uh, step into it. Okay, this is our this is our code. This is our main entry point. And we can create a function out of it. Analysis. Analyze module actually. Uh, analysis add function. So this is it loading the strings, setting the memory for the structures, cleaning up. And then it calls create process. Interesting, where's the print file, uh, printf? It's not here. Uh, am I copying the right file? Oh, am I forgetting to copy the file? I might be forgetting to copy the file. Okay, wait. <laughs> user error, user error. User is incompetent. So, let's see. How much, what is the size of this one? Shouldn't be that much different. It's about the same size. It's exactly the same size. Is the compiler optimizing stuff? No, come on. No, you cannot optimize out these things. Hmm. Uh, 
I'm doing a 64 bit. Uh, Stream injector and okay, because it's weird that it's always the same size. Ah, okay, now it's working, cool. I wasn't probably, I was forgetting to actually copy the file into the, <laughs> which is, uh, well, unfortunate. So what I'm going to do actually, uh, if I do share this code, I will not add this, uh, I will remove this, but I'm just gonna create here a new target. All, you do the prepare. And then you do the binary and then you do a, another thing called copy and copy is basically going to be this command here Oi, sorry this command here so i'm gonna remove the one copy the new one remove the old one copy the new one uh, actually, let me make a note of that. <laughs> to be removed. Uh, actually, to do remove before publishing. Okay. That's, now I can just do make clean all, copy, and it should do everything for me. So, but let's still look at it uh, from a debugger perspective. Uh, it's also actually a good learning for people that don't usually use debuggers, um, because debuggers are the, as I use, the, the source of all truth when it comes to uh, what the process is actually doing. Uh, so. So I like to use x64 uh, dbg is if people people still people some people might remember this if you are uh, old enough uh, there was this debugger that was really really good really awesome called Oli dbg and this is basically more or less a modern version of it it's in, uh, clearly quite uh, ins uh, inspired a lot on it and it's really, really nice debugger, a lot more modern and uh, updated uh, uh, many, many, uh, with many releases. It's, it's really, really nice. I like it quite a lot for quick debug sessions uh, where I know um, the executable more or less uh, is not an, a, such an unknown uh, to me. It's really, really nice uh, debugger slash disassembler. Uh, while I use either for uh, other stuff, other more uh, complex stuff. So that's just my personal taste, anyways. And I also use uh, R2 or Radar or whatever you want to call it, True Cutter. Uh, cutter is also really, really nice nowadays. And it, it, it now has a debugger as well. So you can, it, it's not just a disassembler, it also has support for debugger. So, anyways, I'm going on, uh, on and on and on, uh, but back to the, the actual debugging. So the first one is always, it always lands on NTDLL and most of the time X64 is quite uh, smart on figuring out uh, application entry points. So the first one, which is NTDLL, I just skip 
and as you can see we already landed on the injector main uh, code it's still not the main code this is still a stub uh, and most likely if we push forward it's still on a stub still not the main function that we wrote still not main function that we wrote so as i said in this case it's it broke on my endpoint on my um, breakpoint but when you start debugging windows executables even if they are compiled with mean uh, gw you still have or you still have a lot of stubs that have to be called before your main function uh, but you have to you get a little bit of a sense uh, in this case i already know the executable so i already know that it would call create process so i just went into symbols i saw the injector symbols and you have an import i added a breakpoint to it and when it called back i knew that uh, when it called this function if i just executed until return i know i would the, the debugger would or the process would return uh, back to um, the main uh, function so anyways now oh, yeah now we are seeing the the code that we wrote so let's just go through it so this is once again some setup that is done it's not actual code that we put in but it's a uh, normal setup for Windows APIs and depending on also the the protections that the compiler puts in, for instance, against uh, stack overflows or with stack uh, canary, uh, stack canaries and all these sort of things, it adds more code in the prolog and uh, and uh, postlog of your applications. Is it postlog? That no, anyways. So we can just skip this and you can see here x64 dvg is smart enough to say look we are loading from the data segment a string called firefox so load effective address into uh, rax uh, long pointer so is a keyword pointer um, from the data segment at uh, 404000 and uh, and basically x64 is saying like look this is a string and surely enough if we strap to the code and we look now at racks it's actually pointing to the data segment where the string is defined and then it moves into the stack if you see here it's moving into the stack i believe is it moving into the stack let's Where's the stack? Oh, it's here. I think so. Yeah, I think it's yeah, it's loading into the stack. Yeah, it's loading it into the stack, the address into the stack. Mm -hmm. So now it loaded the, the library. Yeah, it's loading into the bottom of the stack so you can see here yeah i was wondering because it was loading into the stack but i wasn't it seeing it seeing it in the stack but if you look rbp uh is this value so it would be and looking at this i was so it's rbp minus 80 is loading into the stack so stack pointer or stack segment and it's using and it's putting this uh, the the pointer um actually it's here it's putting that pointer uh, the pointer to the to the string into the stack and it's rbp minus 10 so looking at rbp you can see it's 63 fe 20 which was a little bit further down or for, uh, further up in this case in the stack which is here so that's why I wasn't seeing it here in the stack because it was putting it further down here. So it's loading into the stack. Uh, then we move on. It's 
doing 68, 0, and then it's uh, resetting the memory. So, racks, if we look at this value, so you can see here this, and then when we do this, you can see it zeroed out everything. So as I said, even though it is using stack uh, uh, memory, it's not a guarantee that it will be zero, okay? So that's why you need to call uh, zero memory because for example, let's uh, do the, uh, the, the one for uh, process information. So, so if you look, racks is pointing a little bit further down on the stack because these are stack addresses, remember? 63FD880, so it's really loading it in memory. So it should be around here, right? So if we look at what this has, in, what is in the stack, is actually this. So you can see here there are values. After we call um, the zero uh, memory function or the memset function, uh, because if we wrote in the program zero memory, but this is nothing more than uh, RTL zero memory, which is an inline function. If I am not wrong, which is exactly, it's an inline function, or it's not an inline function, it's a macro calling memset. And basically, that's what we are seeing here. Uh, so if we step over it, this value should go to zero. All these values here in the stack should go to zero. So this should disappear. And as you can see here, the values disappeared. Okay, so it zeroed out the stack area where the structure the will be written into. The values of the structure will be written into. So he's doing a lot more setup before the call to the create process. So while in uh, x86 calling convention for Windows, and this is specifically to Windows, they used uh, um, they didn't use that much uh, registers to pass. They didn't use registers the standard calling convention of Windows. Let me add that the standard calling convention because they have other calling conventions. Uh, didn't use register to, registry uh, registers to pass variables while in uh, x64 they do use a uh, register to pass values so you have uh, uh, ACX RDX R8D R9D and then you have the stack as well so these instructions here are all set up for calling uh, the create process function. Actually, let me see if, um, how can I see the debug? The, um, because this, de this debugger used to, or this assembler used to have a function to see a pseudo code of the application but I'm not seeing it here. Maybe I didn't install the plugin? No, that's not the case. Because it used to be a little snowman. A snowman. Uh, maybe I didn't install the plugin or it was removed because it was too buggy. Or maybe it's not available for x64 might not be available i don't remember anyways i wanted to show you a disassembly of uh, what this actually um, represents but this is basically the create process uh, call 
So first argument is uh, ECX, which is in zero, which is a zero. Then uh, RDX is the second argument, which is basically uh, RAX or AIX, which is basically our stream to the Firefox program. And if you look here, that's exactly what we are passing down into create process here. So it's a zero, which is null. Basically, null represents a zero. If you see here, is void, uh, is a pointer that is null, basically. And then the executable, which is the Firefox string. And that's exactly what we are seeing here. So zero or null in this case, and then racks pointing into or uh, sorry, RDX, which then will point uh, to our string. So if we continue to do that, you can see here, RDX is now pointing to this string. And we then call RAX. This is the breakpoint, okay. So let's execute until return. And you can see here it launched. So we can single step. And now, if we call this function, I'm gonna add a breakpoint here after calling the wait for single object. If I just say run, you can see that. No, oh, this did something that I wasn't expecting. Wasn't he supposed to wait? Ah. Okay. Ah. Interesting. I thought it would wait for the, the actual process to... Mm. I thought it would wait. And probably it would if the process uh, took a little bit longer. So let's let's go into the breakpoints. <clears throat> let's clear this one. Who was it? Which one was it? Is this one? This one is the one that we want to keep. So let's remove the other ones. Remove, remove, remove. Okay. Let's close Firefox. Uh, let's launch it again. And... Wow, well, I thought it would wait a lot more than it did, but clearly it's launching quite fast. So anyways. It's all good. I was expecting this to this call to take a little bit longer, but since the process is ready, it just goes on to. Anyways, so I think I'll uh, finish for now. Um, we are able to launch the, the Firefox process. It's working as it should. Then the next step is actually to try and load the library into that process. Uh, we'll do, uh, I'll do that on an next stream. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, and I will see you. Oh, wait, Firefox. I'm still struggling. When I'm on a VM, it's quite the challenge. Yeah, it's a problem with the VMs. I cannot use um, hotkeys to, to change my OBS. Uh, OBS scene, so I have to figure out a way to to change that and to make it work. So, anyways, as I was saying, thanks for watching. 
uh, on the next stream. I'll try to do it tomorrow again. I'm trying to become a little bit more consistent with my streams. And, um, but it's, it's a little bit of a challenge. I have a full-time work. It's, uh, and I have a lot of things. Well, I have, uh, a lot of things to do in the meantime as well. So I'll try to be more consistent, uh, consistent, try to do a one hour stream every day. Uh, and, uh, Hopefully you guys will learn something, I'll learn something, and it's going to be a positive experience to everybody. So anyways, thank you very much, and uh, I'll talk to you uh, in the future. See you. Bye-bye.